Yeah. All right. That's you good. got it? I mean, I do you want it. me to give you more examples? No, nah, that's that's good. I just wanted to hear you respond to the to Yeah, these you know, are weak the yeah, these are weak objections. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well I got one more. I know this is your favorite. I know this is probably the hardest for you to respond to. Um, oh, yeah. Isaiah anyway. nine six. <laughs> yeah, how you know? How you know that's where I was going? <laughs> yeah. Because that's the most pathetic of the point, because I even have an article on this, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly where I was going. Yeah. All right. All right. So Isaiah nine six mm -hmm. and and the Bible reads and uh it's the the one this argument here is is there's an agreement that this is a prophecy of Jesus coming. Yeah, Isaiah nine six. Isaiah 9 6 says, for to us a child is born, talking about Jesus, to us a son is given, okay, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Jesus is Wonderful Counselor. Is. Mighty God. Jesus is Mighty God. Everlasting Father. Jesus is Everlasting Father. Amen. He says Prince of Peace. Now, the one this argument will say, well, it says here, clearly, clearly, that Jesus is Everlasting Father, so he is the Eternal Father in heaven jesus and the father are one your okay. response is what so number one now so now the argument is jesus is the father in human manifestation right yeah but didn't you just say there was another sect of modalism that says no jesus is simply a human man yes a human person distinct so they can't have their cake and eat it too so is this showing that the father himself became the man jesus if so, then that means Jesus is not simply a human man, a human person, and dwelt by the Father. He is the Father. So that form of modalism goes out the window. But secondly, so we can put that out the window. Right. For those who do believe that he is the human mode of the Father, you have a problem. Because if you go back, and there are translations that even render it this way, the expression is avi ad or abi ad, abi ad. Literally, it's the father of everlastingness or of the father eternity. I prefer to use the word everlastingness because when you speak of eternal, you're basically talking about timelessness. Creatures are not timeless. Only God is. Every creature, even angels, are bound to time, space, and place. The difference is we who are believers and angels who are created will live forever. So their life is everlasting, but it's not timeless. We're still bound to time. So I want to make that distinction. Literally, it says the father of everlastingness. He is the father of eternity. What does that mean? Don't take my word for it. Look at any lexical source. Oftentimes, the word father can mean the possessor of something, the source of something. So literally, what it's saying is this child is the father of everlastingness, the father of eternity. And eternity in the sense not of timelessness, but in the sense that everlastingness, never ending life mm -hmm. comes from him because he possesses it. He's a source of it and he confers it upon us to prove to you that the word odd, that's the word everlasting or eternal means never ending everlasting. Let me show how it's used in Isaiah 57, 15 use go there and look at it for me. Isaiah 57, 15. All right, and verse 15 mm -hmm. reads, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity. That's the word odd. Who inhabits eternity. Yes. Whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. Okay, now it says that God inhabits, inhabits eternity. What in the world does that mean? What does it mean that God inhabits eternity? Now, you don't need to take my word for it. I'm going to give you various translations because I wrote an article on this here. Christian Standard Bible, for the high and exalted one who lives forever. Common English Bible, the one who's high and lifted up who lives forever. <clears throat> right? And then this is uh, the complete Jewish Bible. For thus says the high, exalted one who lives forever. Contemporary English. Our God, our holy God lives forever. Now I can go on and on. Names of God Bible. The high and lofty, lofty one who lives forever. The high and lofty one lives forever. New American Bible revised edition. For thus says the high and lofty one, the one who dwells forever. New American Standard Version. 
For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever. Do you get the point? What it means for God to inhabit Ad? The word is Ad. The one who lives forever. So now with that said, what does it mean the child is the father of Ad? He is the possessor of this quality of life, never ending life. It's not saying he's God the father. It's saying that he is the one who gives never ending life who confers everlasting life. And that's exactly who Jesus is. Is it not in John 1 where it says, in him was life, and that life was the light of one, uh, light of men, John 1, 4. Is it not Jesus who says, I'm the resurrection and the life? Is it not Jesus who says in John 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life? So the first one was John eleven twenty five. 25. So what does it mean for the child to be Abiad or Abiad? It means he's the father of, of everlasting life, the father of everlastingness, meaning he possesses never ending life and never ending life comes from him as a gift to us. That's all it means. Doesn't mean he's God the father. What, what, what I love about how you answer that, Sam, is because it not only is it a correction of the, of the objection, but it, excuse me, but it's also a verse that disproves the oneness point. You know, because oneness will teach that Jesus had a beginning and he has an ending. Yes. Right? But yes. this but this verse that is often cited to uh to support or to attempt to support oneness theology is saying that Jesus is actually <laughs> he is everlastingness and he's the father of everlastingness, meaning he did not have a beginning, he does not have an ending because he is eternal. Right. He always has and been. That life that we enjoy, never ending, everlasting life, comes from him. Like I said, I gave you the verses, or like in John 10, 28. I give them everlasting life. And the most apt description of this is first John 1, verses 1 to 2. Read that for me. First John 1, verses 1 to 2. If you want to know what it means for the child to be Abiad or Abiad, not that he's God the Father, but he's the possessor of everlasting life, the one from whom never ending life comes. The one who confers and bestows on us never-ending life. And here you'll find in 1 John 1, verses 1 to 3, John's way of saying what Isaiah said, not the same way, but saying basically the same thing in a different manner, and still affirming that Jesus is not the Father. Because if you go to 1 John 1, 1 John, the epistle, John, 1 John 1, verses 1 to 2, but then also read 3. See what it says. All right. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the father. Pause and right was there for a second, brother. Notice Jesus is the word of life. He is life itself and he's the eternal life that was with the father. And then what does it say? Finish it. And was made manifest to us. And then go all the way to three. See what it says. That which we have, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son Jesus Christ. Now I'm little, I'm confused. How can Jesus be the eternal life with the Father, showing He's distinct from the Father? If Jesus is a creature who came into being or simply a different mode of the father. You know what, you know what, uh, you know, what's kind of standing out to me, Sam, is, you know, how I mentioned how, you know, in, in my research, I see, you know, sort of like two arguments for the oneness argument. You know, one might be that, you know, Jesus is another mode of the father and another might be that Jesus is a distinct person, but the father is in him. But it seems like, that's because of scriptures like this. So it's like depending on which scripture, you know, is going to point out to attempt to have a better argument, they'll go to one of those uh, two um, sects of, exactly. of what, one is that, yeah. right. So, so which one will potentially make the most sense depending on which scripture. Yeah. yeah. Now here in first John, it cannot be a human creature who's said to be eternal life because a human creature is not eternal life. Only God is eternal life. So you can't say this is the human Jesus because that would be idolatry, ascribing to a creature what is true only of God. And then secondly, it makes no sense that this eternal life is the mode of the Father because then again, language means nothing because what John is basically saying is 
Not that the eternal life was with the Father in that he's distinct from the Father. The eternal life is the Father in a different mode. But that's not the plain language. Because then how do you have fellowship with the Father and the Son if the Son is not a distinct divine person right, who became right. flesh? Because if he's simply a mode of the Father, you don't have fellowship with the Father and the Son. You're having fellowship with one person in two modes. It's like saying you're having yeah. fellowship with Sam, the husband, and Sam, the son. Right. So you're having fellowship with both Sam, the husband, and the son, two different persons. You'll say, no, it's the same person, but he may have different roles. How does that make sense? And if it's referring to Jesus, the human, the son, the human son cannot be in fellowship with all believers the world over because that presupposes omnipresence and omniscience. And the human son is not omnipresent, nor is he om om omniscient. Wow. Man, well, good. That's where I go. That's why I'm a Trinitarian. So I don't got a response for you that. I don't know. So, <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm saying. That's actually, I brought that up because uh, people may not be aware. I had two debates with a oneness minister, Stephen Ritchie, who's since deceased. Those two debates can be found on Acts 17 Apologetics, David Wood's channel. It was, does the Old Testament teach a Trinity? Does the New Testament teach a Trinity? He tried to use those objections against me. And I'll let you decide how well he did. And by way of testimony, glory to God, one oneness contact me, said after the debates, by the grace of God's spirit, He's no longer a oneness. He's a Trinitarian. No, oh, to God be the glory. To yep. God be the glory. Now, Hallelujah. now, why is Arianism?